Greetings, brothers and sisters. Greetings, greetings. Welcome to Yes, Jesus Loves Me, But I Still Must Repent, Volume 8. This is a live broadcast. This is not a recorded broadcast. And once again, I am sitting down into the uh, cafeteria of uh, the Veterans Hospital in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, I felt so good about yesterday's event that I thought that I would do it again. And uh, I'm praying and asking the Lord Jesus Christ to please lead and guide me and, and uh, make sure that you know I represent him correctly uh, by the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. Please turn with me in your Bibles to uh, Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. Um, and uh, please, I hope that uh, you've all taken the time out or had the opportunity to listen to one of the other volumes uh, between 1 and, and 7 of this series. Uh, please. So uh, let us go ahead and read uh, from Matthew chapter 6, starting in verse 9. It says, You therefore pray like this, Our Father in heaven, may your name be kept holy, may your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us the food we need today. Forgive us what we've done wrong, as we too have forgiven those who have wronged us. And do not lead us into hard testing, but keep us safe from the evil one. For kingship, power, and glory are yours forever. Amen. For if you forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their offenses, your heavenly Father will not forgive yours. I always read, now brothers, I always read verse 14 and 15 to remind us. You know, to try to be, try our best to be forgiving of others. Not necessarily because they might deserve it, but as Jesus told us, we, we want the Lord to forgive us when we do wrong. So uh, he told us we need to be in the habit of forgiving others when they do wrong toward us. So, uh... I'm going to leave it on that note, and I'm just going to pray and ask the Lord Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus Christ, we ask and pray. Please, by the power and the presence of your Holy Spirit, uh, clean us, wash us up, guide us. Order my speech, Father. Order my interpretation of your, of your Holy Word as we uh, continue to delve into Matthew chapter 5. Um, and preach and um, bring forth the message that uh, you approve of, Lord Jesus, for, for us to have. Amen. Okay, brothers and sisters. So um, we last left off uh, in Matthew chapter 10, around Matthew chapter 10 and 11. I'm going to start back up in Matthew chapter 10. I know we were probably left off yesterday a little further down. Um, but I'm going to start back up in that chapter and um, work my way down, basically. And uh, remember, remind us and preach about some things and comment on some of the things that he said. Now, um, starting in verse 5. He says, how blessed are those who are persecuted because they pursue righteousness for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. You know, um, a lot of the times, a lot of people, a lot of times we, we get, we allow the devil to get us toward it because, you know, we may have entered into the kingdom of, of heaven. We might may have entered into the, uh, to the church. Uh, under the, the guidance of someone who maybe made us think or probably we just misunderstood and we thought that once we became Christians, everything would, you know, just fall into place and life would be, we would be happily ever after. But Jesus reminded us when he first began preaching that blessed are we when we are persecuted because the persecution will come. Okay, and um, now I I just thought about where I was and in the um, in the scriptures. So we're going to read through up until we get to the point where uh, we left off yesterday. 
And then verse 11 says, How blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and tell all kinds of vicious lies about you because you follow me. Rejoice, be glad, because your reward in heaven is great. They persecuted the prophets before you the same way. And as I told you yesterday in volume 7, um, I looked up, I googled it. You can all google it and find out what happened to prophets Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Jeremiah. How did they, how did they um, die, basically? And you will find that uh, they say that uh, Isaiah was sawed in half. And, um, you know, uh, uh, I think Ezekiel met uh, in, uh, a, a similar fate. Jeremiah, I think he lived out his days as was prophesied through him. He, uh, the Lord told him he would live out his days uh, in, a, in a specific place in Jerusalem or in Israel where he was supposed to have bought a field and then after the king of Babylon had took over the field, he would live there. But the other prophets, many of the other ones, uh, you know, um, Micah, Zephaniah, Zechariah, and, and all of them, uh, according to this Google, um, what I Googled, many of those people had met uncertain, um, you, you might think was a misfortunate death um, because of, of preaching the word of God. To uh, uh, their own people who did not want to hear it at that time, you know, so they didn't want to hear the word of God so much that they actually killed the prophets and um, persecuted, you know, and killed some of the prophets who brought the word of God forth. And so Jesus says here, "Blessed are we when we are being persecuted." Blessed are we when people tell all kinds of false lies, you know, just because we follow, we want to, we thirst for righteousness and we want to follow him according to the actual word. And remember he said here, you are the salt of the earth. And he's talking to us of the land. He's talking to us Christians. When we live in righteous obedience unto the Lord, we are the salt of the earth. Then he says, but if the salt becomes tasteless, and I had reflected that yesterday, um, just like it says in Ezekiel, I mean, Ezekiel chapter 33, how it says, you know, um, that God said to Ezekiel, tell the people when a righteous person begins to trust in his former righteousness and starts sinning, all of his former righteousness will be forgotten because that person will start sinning. And that righteous person who now is living in sin will surely die. And so uh, Jesus says it here, you are the salt of the land. But if that salt becomes tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out for people to trample on. And so that's a warning for those of us who call ourselves believers. It's one thing to say I'm a believer, but it's another thing to actually live the life in obedience that we're supposed, the righteous life we're supposed to live. The reason why I'm going back over this again is because I was thinking about, um, in my past, I, I saw the movie, I saw the original movie when we were kids. We watched the original movie, Jesus Christ Superstar. And when it just reminded me about this one particular scene where they're singing, um, they're singing, uh, Christ, you know I loved you, didn't you see I waved? I believe in you and God, now tell me that I'm saved. And um, I wanted to let you know, by the way, brothers and sisters, I forgot to put on my timer. So, um, this probably might go a little bit more than, than an hour because I forgot to put my timer on for our breaks. But I just put it on. Lord, forgive me. So uh, getting back to that scene, you know, um, that's the song that, that the uh, people were singing. Christ, you know I love you. Didn't you see I wave? I believe in you and God. Now tell me that I'm saved. And then the next scene after they sing that song, 
Jesus brings it back to to a solemn kind of uh, kind of statement, and he's letting them know if you really understood what it meant or what you had to do, you know, you only have to die in, in a sense to your sins. And the people had these confused looks on their faces. And I didn't really understand it, even though when I was a child, I used to watch the movie Jesus Christ Superstar, and I was so, so uh, elated over the, um, the it being a musical and all of that that I didn't really get that point. Or maybe I did, but I didn't realize what the point was. And it's the same point that is the topic of my, my series. And, you know, um, people think... And people thought back then, too, that they make an appearance in church or they praise the Lord's name and then that's it. Then because I went and praised your name, now tell me that I'm saved, Jesus. Tell me that I'm all right. And then the next scene, he says, well, you only he tells them you only have to die. And they're like saying, die to what? Die to your sinful nature and be born again. That's what he's he's telling them that, you know. You have to get rid of that sinful nature. It's not just because you praise me in church. It's not just because you call me Lord, Lord. So, I mean, you know, it's very interesting how, you know, reading this yesterday and preaching about it, it made me think about that, you know. So that, that lets me know, you know, this, that's kind of like confirmation. That lets me know that there's other people out there who also know, um, who also know, that it's not about just the praise, it's about the obedience, you know, it's about the repentance, you know. So I, I just wanted to say that as I'm reading going down. So he says here then, he tells him uh, in verse 14, getting back into the scripture, he says in verse 14, You are a light for the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Likewise, when people light a lamp, they do not cover it with a bowl and put it on the lamp, um, but put it on a lampstand so that it shines for everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before people so that they may see the good things you do and praise your Father in heaven. That's partially why I decided to do a few podcasts out in public, not just in my studio all the time. Um, you know, with the hope, brothers and sisters, that somebody might come by, another Christian or another, uh, or even uh, someone who is seeking salvation and doesn't know where to find it. You know, who knows? Only God knows. You know, my action might, might lead somebody to want to put their faith in Christ by being out in public. Now, are there a lot of people around me? No. Do Right now, do they think that uh, I might be on a special phone call probably so but i just i'm going to put my faith in the lord that the holy spirit would lead and guide my all of my steps that maybe it could lead to having uh, a new listener somebody that you know would get motivated to want to live the rest of their life for jesus christ okay so anyway he says here um we're going to go into verse 15 Okay, light, okay uh, verse 16. In the same way, let your light shine before people. Okay, verse 17. Do not think that I have come to abolish the Torah or the prophets. I have come not to abolish, but to complete. And I said that uh, yesterday, and some people already, you know, upset with me saying that, that Jesus was saying, you know, I told you about um, some people, they go to a church and their pastor is telling them not to study the Old Testament. And that as, as if um, they would be in trouble with the Lord if they studied the Old Testament. Okay? And um, I spoke about that. You know, uh, Jesus quoted out the Old Testament all the time. And it's still God's word. So be very, very careful. Like I said, some people have false beliefs. They call themselves Christian, but they may be having a false belief. Maybe they grew up in church hearing people say this and they thought it was is the truth. But, you know, God calls some of us to, 
to tell the truth about even his word. Okay, so um, he says here, when he says, do not think that I've come to abolish the Torah or the prophets, he's saying, I have not come to change any of the commandments. The commandments of God are still the same. So, what, so, but we know Jesus made some changes. What changes did he make? What the change that he made was not in the commandments themselves, but in the sense that before Jesus came, things were, were finite. Things were of, some things were of this world. What Jesus came to do was to take what was once considered finite and bring it into the spiritual realm the holy spiritual realm and that's what jesus did the same commandments of god from the beginning of time you know when moses went and all of them were out there slaughtering animals and sacrificing animals and things it had a sense of of being finite and just flesh wise because animals as we will read in hebrews it says that animals slaughtering animals cannot really wash the soul from sin Something spiritual has to be the atonement, who is Jesus, right? Something spiritual had to atone for the, uh, for the slaughter of the animals. So uh, um, that's particularly what Jesus came to do. And a lot of people, you know, they say, oh, no, that's not what he came to do. He came to do all this other stuff. But he, he himself, that's what he's saying here. He, I came, he came to complete the Old Testament and um, and the prophets who prophesied that he would be coming. He came to fulfill that prophecy. And then here, picking back up in verse 18, he says, Yes, indeed, I tell you, not un that until heaven and earth pass away, not so much as a yud or a stroke will pass from the Torah, not until everything that must happen has happened. So whoever disobeys the least of the Old Testament commandments, I say the least of the, he says the least of the commandments, right, of these commandments, and teaches others to do the same, to do so will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. This is what, you know, happens a lot. Younger people are being told by older Christians, younger Christians are being told by older Christians, and this is what, what, you know, is a problem. Oh, don't worry about your life. You know, don't worry about the sinful things you do. Nobody's perfect. You know, uh, don't, don't beat yourself up. Don't do this, that, and the other. And I agree to a point because I know we cannot take anything away that we've done in the past. And I wouldn't want people to beat themselves up over what they've done in the past because... We, can, we don't have no way of going back into the past. That's why Jesus, also why Jesus came. We don't have no time machine where we could fix our, our um, sinful blunders ourselves. That's why he came, so that we, he could be a, the redemption for us in that sense. But that does not give us a green light to sin. That does not give us a green light to think, well, my sin is no longer sin and I don't have to repent from it. My sin is no longer sin, so therefore I don't have to stop participating in certain types of activities that the Old Testament says is sinful before the eyes of the Lord. This is why Jesus said, do not think that I've come to abolish or to change any of that. He did not. You know, he just brought it from the, the, the finite world, all the laws of God from the finite world, over into the spirit where now you know that same law of God ought to be written on the hearts of those of us who say that we are devoted to Christ so that's what um, that's what uh, he's saying right here so let's look a little further now I got um, I know I've gone past 15 minutes but since I started my time clock I'm going to go ahead and let the time clock play. And so our first break will actually be, um, this is a live show, so I can't, couldn't fix it. Our first break is going to be in about four minutes. Okay, so let's lead, read a little further. Uh, and I apologize for those of you who are waiting for the break to come at 15 minutes. <laughs> uh, I know it's been over 15 minutes. Um, 
He says, yes, indeed. I tell you that until heaven and earth pass away, not as much as a yud or a stroke will pass from the Torah. Not until everything that must happen has happened. Verse 19. So whoever disobeys the... Okay, teach the others the same. We were there, okay. Um, heaven. But whoever obeys them... See, so we didn't finish that one. Okay, so he says in verse 19. So whoever obe disobeys these commandments... But whoever obeys them and so teaches uh, will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. See, we might not be able to, those of us who are older and have already committed sins in the past, we might not be, of, of course, we can't, we can't go back and change anything, but we can still be a guide to young people. Let those young people know. We should not be embarrassed to let those young people know before you go off and make those foolish decisions, listen for, from someone who already went down that road and made those foolish decisions and reaped nothing but bad from it, in a, in a sense, to be a warning, to be a guiding light to those coming behind us. You don't want to go down that road because this is all that road has for you. It doesn't have the blessings that you think you're going to receive from it. Now, we can't force younger people to, to do anything. But we can at least tell them. You know, we can at least warn them. God already knows. God already knows who's going to listen and who's not going to listen. But it's still our responsibility to tell the gospel truth when we know it. When we have confessed and, and come to understand where we have gone wrong. It's still our obligation to tell that gospel truth. So he says here... Um, in verse 20, for I tell you that unless your righteousness is far greater than, than that of the Torah teachers, the Bible scholars, and the Prussian, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I'm not knocking, personally, brothers and sisters, I'm not knocking Bible colleges and things of that nature or places of education where, where you can go get educated on the word of God. But Jesus just sat, just sat up here and said that our, um, our righteousness has to exceed far the greater than our biblical knowledge. Righteousness, obedience over your knowledge. A lot of people have a lot of knowledge about what the Bible says, but that doesn't mean that they're living it. And that's what matters more to God, that we live in obedience to his word, to his commandments. Not just we acknowledge that his commandments exist, not that we just acknowledge that Jesus is Lord and Savior, but go on and continue living our sinful, wicked lives, thinking that, that we're going to be blessed because we gave him recognition. We went to church, maybe, and we praised his name. Now, I'm not telling people not to praise his name. I got 55 seconds. I'm not telling people not to praise his name. No, of course, praise his name. But understand that the obedience is most important because that's where so many of us are falling. That's what's so confusing to those who are already lost or still lost. When they see Christians and they see one Christian doing something and then they see another Christian doing the totally the opposite, but they're all Christians, you know, that's what the confusing thing is. It sh should not be that way. But we know that's the way it is. Why? Because there's so much opinionated about the Word of God. And we need to start asking the Lord if we're living, thinking, and speaking the way that He approves, not based on other people's opinion. So we're going to go to our first break. Uh, and when we come back, uh, we will continue in Matthew chapter 5. Train, the evening train, the evening train, the 
church and let's go home. Get right, church, and let's go home. Get right, church. Get right, church. Get right, church. Let's go home. All right, all right, brothers and sisters. Okay, yeah, all right, so... We're going to go back to um, reading that verse 20. If you came in off the break, and uh, this is a live show. So we're going to come back to, ver- to verse 20. This, once again, this is First Messianic Ministry of Nashville Incorporated. We are speaking through, this is volume 8 of the series, Yes, Jesus Loves Me, But I Still Must Repent. And right now we are in speaking out of Matthew chapter 5, verse 20. It says, For I tell you that unless your righteousness is far greater than that of the Torah teachers and the Pushim. Now get this, the loving Jesus said, says here, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. He's hinting also to the fact that we must be born again. It's not just, he he says the Torah teachers, the Bible teachers and the Pharisees. It's not just your knowledge that's going to, that, 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 that um, we can get Christ's approval. Christ, Christ approve, must approve of us. He's the one that approves of us getting in heaven. But he's got to approve of us being truly righteous in, a, on a, in our inner heart. When he looks down at us, you know, there's a lot of people who um, educate themselves in the Bible, but they don't really believe that they have to repent. They don't really believe that they have to stop living and in, in participating in acts of adultery or fornication or homosexuality. There's a lot of people saying, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. But I think I can still, I, I believe I have the right to still continue to live in these discuss, and do these disgusting practices before the Lord. And Jesus said he's going to bless me and let me into heaven anyway. You know, that's the great deception. Okay, so now we're sitting here and we're seeing what the Bible says, the loving Jesus. I would say, I always say that the loving Jesus, because everybody wants to throw up that Jesus is love. When you start talking about, hey, let's, let's just truly turn away from the uh, sinful things that he told us we should be turning away from. You know, they want to throw up Jesus is love and you're persecuting and you're judging me and doing all this kind of stuff. Throwing up that, that smoke screen. But I just wanted to let y'all know right there. If y'all got your Bibles open, you can see it right there. It's right there in your face. I don't have to uh, I don't have to uh, sugarcoat anything. Jesus himself said, if our righteousness, you know, unless our righteousness is far greater than that of the, the Bible teachers and the priests, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I, I, I want to ask those of you who will always try to throw up, well, the, the, the meaning of Christianity is love in a sense that you don't have to repent from your sins. What do you think about that? What do you think about what Jesus just said right there? You know, remember, First Masonic Ministry of Nashville Incorporated, we are not a condemning ministry we don't condemn but at the same time i must preach just like jesus said up here earlier he made me a lamp for the world a light for the world all right so i must let my light shine the light that he gave me shine you know and i'm not too concerned about whether you personally whoever out there is listening agree with what i'm saying but i'm going to continue to preach what god gives me to preach It is up to you. I was just talking to someone about this last night. It is up to you as an individual who wants to show God and get Christ's approval for your life to pray and ask the Lord if you think Daryl is speaking from his own understanding or is it something that you really need to hear? Not necessarily what you want to hear, but is this preaching something that you really need to hear? That you really need to take into heart. 
that's when I want to encourage you. I want to remind you, the First Messianic Ministry of Nashville Incorporated, you know, I'm preaching you like just like a, a, um, a football coach would, would do his best to encourage uh, encourage his, his, uh, his team to do the right thing, to stay in the game and to win the game, right? You know, this life is not a game. Christianity is not a game, but I'm just using an example. Or um, a weightlifting coach or a dietary coach, somebody that, that's encouraging you to stick to your diet. You know, if you want to see good results, you have to stick to the program, basically. And that's what Jesus is saying here in the Sermon of the Mount. He's doing the same thing. If you want to be blessed by God for real, then you're going to have to stick to God's program. Not try to change it, to alter it to what to what what you think is best for you. Because if you thought if you knew what was best for you, you would not be coming to God in the first place, asking for His help. Okay, so uh, let's go on further. Verse twenty one mm-hmm. says, "You have heard your fathers were told, do not murder." Now this is another hard one. This ain't easy stuff. It says, do not murder. And that anyone who commits murder will be subject to judgment. But I tell you that anyone who nurses anger against his brother will be subject to judgment. And whoever calls his brother, you good for nothing, will be brought before the Sanhedrin. That whoever says, fool, encourages the penalty of burning in the fire of Gehenom. Remember we read in the other, um, I read to you the commentary, 522. I'm going to refresh your memory and read that commentary. Again. He says here, uh, they say down here in the commentary about, about um, verse 22. He says, uh, burning in the fire of Gehenom or Gehenna. Maybe some of your Bible says Gehenna. Um, but we're talking about the same place. It says the Sanhedrin is a Jewish court. Local courts had three or 23 judges. The central Sanhedrin in Jerusalem has 70. Gehenom translates to the Greek and English as Gehenna or hell. Literally, it's Hebrew for the Valley of Hinnom, located then and now just outside the old city of Jerusalem, not far from the Temple Mount. It was originally a place where the Canaanites sacrificed their children. So it was a place where much screaming from the children screaming was continually heard. Later, rubbish fires regularly burned there. It became a, a dung heap or a trash, a trash place where people threw their trash out and burned their trash often spontaneously bursting into flames in the hot sun. Hence, it was used as a metaphor for hell. Okay? So the Hebrew word in all these verses was shol. It usually corresponds to the Greek Hades. Okay? So I wanted to read that to refresh your memory. Um, because this is preaching. Okay? So um, Jesus says here, right here, you know, that some people... You know, if they refuse to to uh, pay heed to this commandment that he gives, we'll find yourself in hell. I had some people say, well, you can't be preaching that people are going to hell. You know, they got this, this idea that um, you're being judgmental if you're preaching that people are going to hell. And I also, I like to ask them sometimes, well, do you think Jesus was being judgmental when he told people that, they would be going off into hell if they did not pay heed to the warnings. Okay, so the loving Jesus even said that people, some people are going to be going to hell. You know, how does that, how does that make some people feel? Because I know there's a lot of churches out there that won't preach this stuff. They will not preach these things out of fear of what? Being persecuted. You know, so they've made the, the Jesus to be a loving Jesus, almost like Santa Claus, who never would say anything harsh or bad to people. 
So this simply is not true. <laughs> As we can see in the word of God, this is not true. You know, and as we had read uh, one of the verses in Proverbs, or if I did not read it, uh, one of the verses in Proverbs I was listening to, into my car, it says, rebuke is better than flattery in the long run. A person will appreciate you for rebu rebuking them and telling them the truth rather than filling their head full of flattery. You know, because why? Because after the end result of, of that flattery comes, people will know, well, this person didn't really care about me. All this time they flattered me. I just wish they would have just told me the truth. So even though I was happy in the past, I'm crying now because, because no one took the time to really tell me. Or maybe they did take the time to tell you, but you didn't want to hear it. You know, it could be either or. Nonetheless, you know, I, I do like to mention to people when they say that to me, Jesus is love. He would never say a, a harmful thing. Well, the Bible is the place where we learn about Jesus. And Jesus in the Bible, the Jesus in the Bible is speaking the truth. He's not speaking based on what people think he should say. He's telling the plain truth about what we all should be paying heed to. So verse 23 says, So if you are offering a gift at the temple altar, and you remember there that your brother has something against you, leave your gift where it is by the altar, and go make peace with your brother. Then come back and offer your gift unto God. That's what he's saying. Then he says again here, this is some hard teaching because, because we're so quick to want to um, hold grudges against people. You know, some of this stuff that's being said right now, we think we have the opportunity. We, we try to tell ourselves we have a, a choice of if we, want, if we really want to follow this or not. But Jesus is watching. And see, we should always ask ourselves or pray and ask him, if he approves of our steps, if he approves of our choices we make. Verse 25 says, if someone sues you, oh, come to terms quickly with him quickly while you and he are on the way to court. Or he may hand you over because you might be the one in the wrong. He may hand you over to the judge and the judge to the officer of the court and you may be thrown into jail. Yes, indeed. I tell you, you will certainly not get out until you have paid the last penny. Verse 27. Remember now, this is the loving Jesus talking. And this one is, is, it hits home for me and a lot of people. Verse 27. Okay, that's my second alarm. Okay, we're going to go take a break, and then we'll come back on, on verse 27, okay, brothers and sisters? So we're going to take our next break.
I'm going to take this time out to uh, do some shout outs. Let's see. We're going to do some shout outs to Elizabeth Nokivia from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. D. Smith, Antioch, Tennessee. Christy Slaughter from Springfield, Tennessee. Joanne from work. Joanne from Bridgestone Bookstore. Pastor Socrates Hogun of Maranatha Church. Pastor Harold James Friedrichs of Peace Lake Community Church. Bruce Bryant in California. Rita Bryant in California. Thomas Navarro in California. Ira Pacheco in New York. Irving White in New York. <coughs> Renee Bryant in Alabama. Renee from work. Brandon and his wife Millie, my neighbors. Latanya from work. And Leticia Story from Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Um, Brother Clifford from work. Brother Bernard from work. Anisha Thompson from work. Dorothy from work. Kayla from work. Tracy Stokes from work. Pastor Corey D. Busby from the Well Church. And Liney Carlton from Brown Deer, Wisconsin. And um, my Uncle Alfred and his and his wife and um, anyone else that may be listening for the first time. Welcome, welcome all of you. Okay, so we're in our, let's see here. I'm gonna hit my timers. Okay, we're in our third phase of um, volume eight of Yes, Jesus Loves Me, Loves Me, But I Must Still Repent. And we are reading out of Matthew chapter five. And we left off the last break. We left off um, in verse 26, and I was about to state a comment on verse 27, and I, I was saying that this particular comment hits home for me because um, when I got married many, many years ago, when I got married, I was one of these, those people who had that same false belief. I was under the impression that when I got married, or I believed, I told myself, when I got married, that I would no longer have desire or even a thought of another woman, of being with another woman. I wouldn't even entertain that thought. And, you know, I, be, I was one of those people who believed, like many of us believe, you know, once you get married, um, you know, you no longer have those thoughts and you just cling to your wife, as the Bible would say, and everything, which, which it was the desire, but the reality struck in you know and I found myself still having temptations trying to understand you know being disillusioned because I was I was all disillusioned because I, I really thought I would not have any desire or even need or, or a desire for to be with somebody else and so although I did not never commit an act I didn't commit the act that I let my thought processes, you know, run wild. And so Jesus says here, you have heard, verse 27, you have heard that our fathers were told, do not commit adultery. So this lets me know I'm not the only one. Verse 28, but I tell you that a man who even looks at a woman, another woman, maybe someone who's not his wife, right? A, a woman with the purpose of lusting af after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Okay? So now that hit, hits home because it took a long time for me to accept it. Right? You see, see we're, so I'm not just talking about other people. I, why, am I, why am I sharing this with you? So to, let, to let you know, those of you who know, even right now, after I've done all of this preaching, all these years that I've done all this preaching, there's some people that would say, you know, and God knows that I'm not lying. Some people would say, oh, well, you know, you're not perfect, Daryl. You know, want to justify why they should stay in their sinful nature because Daryl is not perfect. You know, the Lord already knows I'm not perfect. You know, but but it's my responsibility to repent and turn away from from my sins, which I have done and still continue to do. However, I'm, I'm, letting, I'm warning young people right now. Do not use older person, an older person's sin to justify why you can stay in sin. 
you know, don't do that because, see, what you're doing is you're looking for a justifiable reason that you're going to put up before Christ on the day you're standing up before him. You're looking for a justifiable reason to say, well, because that person over there did wrong, I feel I could do wrong too. And then, you know, and I think, you know, if we say, I think Jesus is going to forgive me because I was influenced to do the wrong and this, this, that, and the other. You might have been influenced. The devil may have been there to tempt you. But if you actually did something wrong, you need to repent for it and stop doing it. Or if you're actually doing something wrong with that excuse, I'm here to let you know right now, that's not an excuse that's acceptable that Christ approves of. He's not going to go against the word of God. He's not going to go against the word of God and give you approval to be in heaven if you're not if you're someone who has not repented. Remember what we read in Ezekiel chapter 33? How many of the Israelites thought that just because they were descended from Abraham and Abraham had all these blessings, that they were just going to be blessed too because of a descendancy from Abraham. Overlooking the fact, and I said it in the other volumes too, overlooking the truth that the only reason why God blessed Abraham so much is because of Abraham's faith and obedience unto the word of God, unto God and his commandments. You know, or that the main reason, I should not say the only reason, but the main reason was that Abraham paid heed, obeyed God's word. Abraham wasn't perfect, but he obeyed God's word. Okay, he did his best. He went the extra mile to obey God. And then when this, this stuff right here about adultery, committing adultery in your heart, that was something that I had to actually continue to go to Jesus until he washed it out of me. I had to continue to go to Jesus and say, Lord, if this is not right in your eyes, please wash it out of me. I did not realize what was going on was that he had washed the desire out of me, but Satan still uses the temptation. There's a difference between desire and temptation. And sometimes it can be confusing. But when we go and ask the Lord Jesus to wash something out of us, he has washed it out of us. However, you know, while we live in this world, there will always still be temptation. He has washed it out of us. We need to put our faith in that he, he has washed out away our sins. Yet, we're fighting on the battlefield. We should not allow ourselves to come into the temptation. And that's what we need to be, be careful about, the temptation, not falling into temptation. Why do you think the, the um, Lord's Prayer, what does it say? In your Bibles, in some of your Bibles, in your version, it might even say, lead us not into temptation, meaning help us stay away from temptation. You know, that's the Lord's Prayer in Matthew chapter 6. We'll be getting more into that when we get to Matthew chapter 6. Okay, so he says here uh, in verse chapter uh, of chapter five of Matthew, verse 28. But I tell you, a man who even looks at a, a woman with the purpose of lusting after her has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Then he says in verse 29, the loving Jesus says, if your right eye makes you sin, gouge it out. That means take it out. And throw it away. Better that you lose one part of you than to have your whole body thrown into hell. Once again, the loving Jesus is talking about people going to hell. Now, is Jesus judging folks? Is Jesus condemning folks? Am I condemning somebody because I'm reading what Jesus told us? <laughs> All right. So verse 30 says, and if your right hand makes you sin, cut it off and throw it away. Better that you lose one part of you than to have your whole body thrown into gay and up. All right. See, back then, 
you know, a lot of the, the common folk, they used to try to, you know, give up that excuse when they did something wrong and they didn't want to stop. They would say, oh, my hand made me do it. My eye made me do it. My this made me do it. You know, we know it, it, none, of the, none of your body's limbs can make you do anything. It's in, all up in your brain, right? <laughs> it's in your heart. It's in your soul. Okay, so G, that's why Jesus said what he said. He was pretty much keying in on those people saying, that's not a good excuse. Because if your hand make you sin, might as well cut your hand off so that the rest of you can enter into the kingdom of heaven. You know, if you want to make that lame excuse, then cut that, that part of your body off. You know, he wasn't telling people to go out and literally cut the, that part of their body off. He was trying to show them how much of a lame excuse that is when we know that, it, that, that body parts have nothing to do, does not control your flesh when we say our flesh controls our spirit, what we're saying is that we're allowing our human understanding of right and wrong to control us and turn us away from God's understanding of right and wrong and God's creation of right and wrong. Okay, so when, when that happens, that's why the, the loving Jesus said what he said. Okay? Okay. So now um, we will go on our next break and then we'll pick back up in verse uh, 31. Okay, and, and that's a wonder, uh, uh, another topic that needs great, this, you know, that, that has great, a long, profound, you know, it could be a, a long discussion or it could be a short one basically on, on how much a person knows about that subject. All right, so we're going on our next break now. And when we come back, we'll read that. And hopefully we'll have time to read out. And, uh, and then we'll do Psalm 51. We'll go ahead into Psalm 51, the repentance psalm. And uh, we'll close out uh, on that note. Okay, so here we are. We are in Matthew chapter 5, verse 31. This is uh, volume 8 of uh, our series, the series, Yes, Jesus Loves Me, But I Still Must Repent. Now, re picking back up in verse 31, he says, It was said, whoever divorces his wife must give her a get." Before I go any further, okay, 
That's G-E-T, get. Before I go any further, how many Christians or people that call themselves Christians are on their third and fourth and fifth divorce? Let's look at what the loving Jesus says about that. And I will leave it at that. I've never been divorced. God forbid that I ever get divorced or we ever get divorced, me and my wife. So I've never been divorced. I won't speak too deeply on it, but just, just think about this for a minute. If Jesus says here, you know, it was said whoever divorces his wife must give her a get. Then he says in verse 32, but I tell you, anyone who divorces his wife except on the ground of fornication, that means his wife may have had sex before with someone else before they got married makes her an adulteress adultery is after you're married right okay then and it says and any that anyone who marries a divorcee commits adultery so doesn't the bible say god hates divorce how many people have divorced? I said, you're on your fifth and sixth divorce. Adultery, adultery, adultery. Still saying you're a good Christian. Okay? I mean, I, I'm just throwing that out there. Why? You know, I don't know your personal business. You know, only God does. Yes, yes, yes. But if this is what Jesus said, we must pay heed to it. Now, like I said before, we can't take back what we've done in the past. That's why, you know, regardless of what our, our sins were, that's why at the end of every podcast or at the end of every sermon, that's why we go to Psalm 51. That's the psalm where, where David repented unto the Lord for what he had done. That's why we go to Psalm 51. That's why we go to Jesus you know, hindsight is better than foresight for most of us human beings. And I'm not condemning anybody by saying, asking that question. But it's time that we would repent. We should repent from doing it. You know, what did I say? Our sins are no longer sins. Divorce being one of those sins that God said is a sin in his eyesight. He doesn't like it. He does not like divorce. But we say, well, we, we'll come up with all kinds of re reasons why we can get a divorce, you know. Now, I'm not saying that if a man and a woman, if a man and a woman cannot get along without beating each other on each other, or if, if, if the man is beating up on a woman, I'm not saying that, and nor is Jesus saying that she has to stay with him. But for many years, that's the, the false teaching that a lot of Roman Catholics taught people. That a, a woman was supposed to stay with a man even though he's beating up on her. Well, first of all, that's when you say, well, Jesus is love. And love doesn't beat up on me like this. That's when you can. And there were times in the Old Testament where people got divorces. And it was allowed. You just read Ezra and Nehemiah. The book of Ezra and Nehemiah. How people divorced away from, from the women that were um, of other religions or practicing other religions. That they separated themselves from the, those women because those women were leading people astray into false belief. And they did not want to stop. So there was a divorce. So there are times when the, the Lord allows a divorce. But when you're talking about you're on your fifth and sixth divorce, and I'm, I'm not over-exaggerating. You, are you on your third or fourth divorce? Something's not right. Okay? And something needs to be, that needs to be addressed. Especially if you're calling yourself a Christian and you, you're marrying people and divorcing and, and getting married again and divorcing. That's what Jesus is talking about here. You know, something's not right. Did true repentance take place? Why are you in this position again? Did you not learn from the last time when this happened? Why are you in this position again? So something's not right. And that's all I'll say on that, on that uh, particular, um, particular subject.
you know, because I won't speak no more because I've never been through a divorce. And God, like I said, God forbid that I ever go through one. But uh, here we go again. Uh, we're going to pick up in verse 33. Again, you have heard that our fathers was told, do not break your oath and keep your vows to Adonai. Basically, what he's saying is don't bring up false promises to Adonai. Don't make promises that you do not intend to keep. Okay? Uh, or that you have no ability, no real ability of knowing whether you'll keep them or not. You don't make those kind of promises unto God. Verse 34. But I tell you, not to swear at all by heaven, because it is God's throne. Not by earth. Because it is his footstool, and not by Jerusalem, because it is the city of the great king. And do not swear by your head, because you cannot make a single hair white or black. Swearing means promising. It doesn't mean uh, saying foul language. That's being vulgar. That's a, different, that's a different commandment. A lot of people used to think it meant that this commandment meant the vulgarity. But no, the vulgarity is, is a different commandment. And just like Jesus says, out of the mouth comes what's in your heart. A person that, that often speaks uh, uh, out of vulgarity and all that kind of stuff, one other thing that I had to repent of is because they have, you know, an unclean heart. And I know a lot of people who like to curse don't like to hear that. But that is true. That's something that, that we need to ask the Lord to wash up out of us. If every other word you say is a curse word, something's not right. That's not language. That's not command, a good commandment of, the, of any language, really. And that doesn't mean that you're serious just because you're cursing a lot. You know, some people in the world, they think because they, they're swearing that they should be taken seriously or they're, they're speaking vulgarity. They should be taken seriously. You know, there's no no thing, no good place written anywhere in the Bible that says when a person is speaking vulgar language, they should be taken seriously. Or that they're not joking around. That's not a sign of seriousness. You know, um, he says here, do not swear by heaven or her, the great king. He says here in verse 37, just let your yes be a simple yes and your no be a simple no. Anything more than this has its origin in evil. You siding with the devil. If you, you can't let your simple, you know, just like in the court of law, when they ask you a question, you just give a yes or no answer. Regardless of what the what the what the lawyer or the, the prosecutor or whatever tries to twist things around to, just give a simple yes or no answer. Or if you can't answer the question, you just say no comment. If you think it's a trick question. But don't try to give explanation for anything because the moment you start giving explanation, that's a sign, that's, that's how people will look at it. They'll perceive that you're trying to hide, to hide the truth. Okay, so let your let yes be yes and your no be no. You know, anything else more than that comes to has its origin in evil. It's not, you're not sincere. Okay, so I got two minutes and 33 seconds. I says so here, I'm going to read out to the end of it. I mean, you have heard that our fathers were told eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But I tell you not to stand up against someone who does you wrong. On the contrary, if someone hits you on the right cheek, let him hit you on the left cheek too. If someone wants to sue you for your shirt, let him have your coat as well. If a soldier forces you to carry his pack for one mile, carry it for two. When someone asks you for something, give it to him. When someone wants to borrow something from you, lend it to him. Okay? That's hard, another hard commandment to follow. But this last one minute and 42 seconds, um, let me just go ahead and read out, and then we'll go into um, Psalm 51. 
and then we'll um, close out. The last things you'll hear uh, will be uh, Restore the Joy song and then closing out of uh, the closing out of this particular sermon. Okay, so he says here, verse 43, You have heard that your, our fathers were told, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Then you will become children of your Father in heaven. This is a commandment. This is not to be argued with, brothers and sisters. He says, for he makes, for God makes the, his sun shine on the good and the bad people alike. And he sends rain down to the righteous and the unrighteous alike. What reward do you get if you love only those who love you? Why, even the tax collectors do that. And if you are friendly only to your friends, are you doing anything out of the ordinary? Even the Gentiles do that. Therefore, be perfect, just as your Father in heaven is perfect. Now I got seven to five seconds. Okay, so um, let's let this alarm go out. Okay, now, hallelujah, brothers. We got through, brothers and sisters, we got through Matthew chapter 5. It took eight volumes to just to get through Matthew chapter 5. Wonderful. Hallelujah. Um, like I said, we're going to go uh, right now and we're going to close out. When we read Psalm 51, brothers and sisters, I want you to think about the things that, that you've done against God or the things that you know or maybe don't even know you've done against God. You're asking God to forgive you for those things as we read. You know, that's why we read Psalm 51. I'm asking God to forgive me for the things that I, do, that I know I've done or I don't even know I've done. When I read, as we read together, all of us, each of us should be thinking about our own lives, our own responsibilities, and our own sins, and our own acts of righteousness. And, you know, it should be on our hearts that we're asking the Lord Jesus to approve of us so that we would have eternal life with him. And I'm hoping you're there now. I shall begin to read. And I will see you... Um, now that we've finished Matthew, I may change the name to this, of the series, or it still might be, Yes, Jesus Loves Me, But I, must re I Still Must Repent, um, because we're going to read more of what Jesus has to say about it. So there just may be another volume 9. We may have to go into 9 and 10. We may have a, a bunch of volumes. Okay? So um, thank you for spending this time with me in volume 8. Uh, okay, so here we go. For the leader of da leader, a psalm of David, Matthew chapter. I mean, we're reading uh, Psalm fifty-one. When Nathan the prophet came to him after his affair with Bathsheba, says God, in your grace, have mercy on me. In your great compassion, blot out my crimes. Wash me completely from my guilt, and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my crimes, and my sin confronts me all the time. Against you, you only, have I sinned and done what is evil from your perspective so that you are right in accusing me and justified in passing sentence. True, I was born guilty, was a sinner from the moment my mother conceived me. Still, you want truth in the inner person. So make me no wisdom in my inmost heart. Sprinkle me with hyssop and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. Let me hear the sound of joy and gladness, so that the bones you crush can rejoice. Turn away your face from my sins and blot out all my crimes. Create in me a clean heart, God. Renew in me a resolute spirit. Do not thrust me away from your presence. Do not take your rock hakodesh away from me. That's the Holy Spirit. Restore my joy in your salvation and let a willing spirit uphold me. Then I will teach the wicked your ways and sinners will return to you. You see how David did not hide in a corner 
because he had done something wrong and he asked God to forgive him, that was not the, the, the time to go hide in a corner. As people will try to make you do, oh, you're a sinner too. You don't need to be preaching the word of God. Go hide off in the corner somewhere. No, that's not what you do. You know, you should be so thankful that God has forgiven you of what you've done wrong. That you feel enthused. You feel motivated. You feel energized to go out and tell somebody else about Jesus. How they could be, you know, they could be born again themselves. How they could be enjoying the blessings of God just like you. Then picking back up, it says, Rescue me from the guilt of shedding blood, God, God of my salvation. Then my tongue will sing about your righteousness. Adonai, open my lips. Then my mouth will praise you. For you do not want sacrifices, or I would give them. You do not take pleasure in burnt offerings. My sacrifice to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not spurn a broken, chastened heart. In your good pleasure, make Zion prosper. Rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices and burnt offerings and whole burnt offerings. Then they will offer bulls on your altar. Heavenly Father, we come to you right now, sweet name of Jesus Christ, saying thank you for getting us through this time uh, and this preaching. We pray and ask in, in Jesus' name that each and every person who was able to hear your word today receive the blessing that you would, would approve of, Lord Jesus, uh, and that would make their lives a blessed experience in your name. We pray. Amen. All right. Thank you, brothers and sisters. Like I said, um, you'll hear the song and then the outro. And I hope this, to, hear, to have you back in volume nine.
primary mission of First Messianic Ministry of Nashville Incorporated is in fact the Great Commission which can be found right in the New Testament Gospels of the Holy Bible. Matthew chapter 28 verse 18 to 20, Mark chapter 16 verse 15 to 20, Luke chapter 24 verse 44 to 53, John chapter 21 verses 15 to 24, and Acts chapter 2. The First Messianic Ministry of Nashville Incorporated does not preach condemnation. The First Messianic Ministry of Nashville Incorporated preaches 100% repentance from all Holy Bible sin and that true salvation can only come through acknowledging that there is no other sa true Savior of all humanity except Jesus Christ. There is no other religion or belief system in existence that can accomplish what Jesus accomplished for us when he died on the cross. Also, the only way to receive Christ's forgiveness is to willingly repent, meaning turn away from all thoughts, speech, or activities that are declared sinful or wicked before the presence of the Almighty Father, Yahweh, according to the Holy Bible. One must be faithfully willing to allow the blood of Jesus Christ to spiritually wash the soul of all unrighteousness and be anointed by the power and presence of the Holy Spirit and be obediently water baptized.